Hi guys, uh, Isaac again. Finally getting around to the Monday paper, uh, the multiple choice paper, um, which is the final paper for this week's AS. And I'm just sure I'm on the right paper. Uh, this is annoying when this happens. Yeah, this is the right paper. Okay, so it's, yeah, the May-June 2016 multiple choice paper. Um, you know the drill with these multiple choice papers now. Running through, please, please do get back to me with any questions you might have. Um, start with question one. So here we have a driver making the following estimates and considering the purchase of the car, which she intends to use only when she would otherwise have used public transport. So the key things here are going to be the fact she uses it only when she would otherwise have used public transport. And she's got to think about these. So the purchase price of the car is 6000 after one year, the car is worth 4500 These are the costs of using the car for a year and the cost of using public transport instead. And what are the potential earnings after tax on a 6000 invested for a year? So this is, if she didn't spend the money on a car, what, what would she get back on it? What are the opportunity cost in money terms to the driver over the year of traveling by car rather than by public transport? So what's the opportunity cost in monetary terms? So she could have basically you want all your costs plus the opportunity plus plus the opportunity cost, so she wouldn't have to have bought the car. Six thousand. Uh, but she could have, she, she could sell the car after one year, so because it's only one, over the year, so she's lost the value of the car is fifteen hundred, so six thousand minus four thousand five hundred, so we've got fifteen hundred there. Well, the costs of operating the car are um, one thousand eight hundred, but we also want to. Minus this 800 because that's the cost she cost of using public transport. So she saves that. So she's saving 800, but she's having to spend 1800. So she's spending a thousand there. So we've already got our 1500 plus a thousand from there. Plus these earnings because she could have just used the money, the 6000 instead of buying the car, she could have put it in the bank. We invested it for a year and got 500 pounds. So 2500 plus 500 give you 3000. So it's kind of just an accounting question there. Question two. The transition of centrally planned economies to market economies has been accompanied by a significant change in the composition of our output. What was the immediate consequence of this transition? Well, often what you had was um, an increase in structural unemployment. Basically, you wouldn't have, uh, when you change the composition of output, for example, suddenly you're moving from outputting kind of agricultural crops to manufactured crops, you're going to get structural unemployment because the people who work in the fields now can't work in the factories and not paying. You get a group of people unemployed. Remember, structural unemployment is where the economy, the skills the economy needs aren't matched the skills the economy have. The, the, the labor force has that structural unemployment. So you get that in this case. Question three. Here the diagram shows the production possibility curve of two economies, X and Y. And we're being asked which statement about the two economies is correct. Both economies here always have identical opportunity costs. Is that the case? No, they don't. Otherwise, they'd be straight. And they'd be on the same... Um, same um, gradient. Both economies have the same future growth prospects. That's not the case either. The opportunity costs are constant in each economy. Well, yes, we know that the opportunity cost is constant because the lines are straight. If the lines weren't straight, the opportunity cost would be fluctuating, but we know the answer C there. Question four. Here we have a production possibility curve showing labor intensive farming output and capital intensive manufacturing output. What would not cause a shift in this curve? Well, we're talking about kind of farming output and this capital intensive and labor intensive. So though they're kind of different productive processes, they're, they're different in the sense that the inputs are more intensive in either. So what would not cause a shift in either of these curves? Well, if we're changing sales tax on manufactured products, then we're not going to cause a shift in any of them. We'd have to affect either labor costs or capital costs and a reduction in sales tax doesn't change any of those. So that would not cause a shift. If you think about training workers, that would change the labor intensive farming output and become productive if you train, uh, sorry, if you train manufacturing workers better, the capital and manufacturing output would be better, although not as much because it's capital intensive. Improvements in the productivity of agricultural machinery would probably improve the farming output a little bit, but they're not more intensive. And if you take the land used for both, you're going to uh, kind of not really shift the curve. You're going to shift, you would shift the curve inwards because you just can't make as much or uh, either agriculture or in manufacturing because you've taken away the land that's actually to build. So A is the only one that wouldn't change any of these and none wouldn't cause a shift. Question five. So here in calculating the short run supply schedule for a firm, we have to assume certain things remain unchanged. This is just an important question to know. Generally, when we're using short run supply, we say that something has to be fixed. And in this case, we say the technology is fixed. That's just something to learn. State of technology is short run. 
we allow the quantity of labor and the quantity of capital to fluctuate in the short run technology is fixed and we're assuming they're working with similar kind of knowledge of the way things are produced and the similar um Technology machineries, you can just see buy more or less or buy more labor or less of machines or labor. So we assume technology is just worth learning that as a fact. Question six. There are two main types of coffee grow, Arabica and Robusta. OK, whatever. Uh, the table gives details of the four largest coffee producers in countries. So we've got Brazil, Vietnam, Indonesia and Colombia. And we know the production is measured in 1060 kilogram bags okay it doesn't really matter how how we measure it it's just those are the units what can be concluded so can we say that brazil has the highest level of specialization mm, not from this um you can't really conclude that brazil produces more coffee than the other three named producers together well if we add their total output and output pick that box and say yes uh, that's the thing we know Robusta coffee production is greater than Arabica coffee production. Well, if you add these figures up, it's actually the case that Arabica coffee is higher than um, Robusta coffee, I think, uh, if you do that. So it's the case it's the other way around. Vietnam has comparative advantage in Robusta and Colombia and Arabica. Uh, Vietnam has comparative advantage in, what's it saying, Robusta. But it does have comparative advantage in Robusta, that is true, and Colombia does have in Arabica, but you can't really make that statement compared to the others. You can only make it in Vietnam and Colombia. Not necessarily the case. You'd probably say Brazil has comparative advantage in Arabica. Right. Um, well, so you wouldn't actually say that that's the case. So B is the correct answer there. It's just really simple. Question seven. A manufacturer progressively reduces the price of his product in an attempt to increase total revenue. The table here, we're showing the outcome of this policy. Um, what is the price elasticity of demand? So here we see that total revenue remains the same, no matter how much you change the price. And if that's the case, then uh, price elasticity of demand has to be unitary. You just know that if, if it was uh, inelastic, we would see as the price goes down, we'd see total revenues decreasing. And if it was elastic, then as the price went down from 10 to 9 to 8, we'd see total revenues increasing. So. But because they remain constant, total revenue remains constant, it's unitary elasticity of demand there. Question eight. Public transport here has an income elasticity of demand of minus 0.36. So if you increase everyone's incomes in the country by 1% or increase someone's income by 1%, their demand for public transport is going to go down by 0.36%. What does it mean? Well, when and what's in the world well, here, it's important to know the types of related, what we describe different types of goods as depending on the income elasticity. So an income elasticity of demand is positive, is known as a normal good. So as incomes go up, you demand more of it, fine. Well, if as incomes go up, you do demand less of it, then we know it is an inferior good. It's only a good that people consume when they don't have very much money. It's deemed to be inferior. One of the great example of that is public transport. When people have more money, they tend to take cabs, they tend to drive more, because if you can avoid public transport, you generally do. So that's that's just what we call an inferior good is one with a negative elasticity. The income elasticity of demand. The price elasticity of supply here is so question nine of an app for a phone is perfectly elastic. The current selling price for the app is ten dollars and two hundred apps are sold every day. The app becomes more popular and as a result demand increases by fifty percent at every price. What will be the outcome of the change in demand? Well, because we know that it's perfectly elastic, you can't raise the price anymore or, or demand basically rockets to the bottom. If you increase the price, if you if you reduce the price anymore, demand rockets to the top. So the price stays the same. You don't change the price because you've got 50 percent more demand at every price. The firm's revenues increase by 50 percent. So that's kind of a knowledge of the perfectly elastic. You can't actually change the price if you have a perfectly elastic uh, demand. There's no way you can change the price. So the price would have to stay the same. The firm's revenues don't increase by an infinite amount. They only increase by 50 percent because that's how much demand is increased. In the diagram shown, D1 and S1 uh, are the initial demand and supply things. So there's the equilibrium at the start. And um, now we've got S2. So we've seen supply increase and accompanied by demand increase. So we get this equilibrium at the same price. Price You can see it's kind of level, but a higher one. But what's going to cause that? So we're looking for something that would shift supply out for increase in supply, but also increase demand. So what would increase supply? Um, well, uh, 
let's look at the options. A fall in real incomes, that would decrease demand, so that's not right. Fall in unemployment, uh, probably increase demand, so that could work. A removal of subsidies from the car industry is going to decrease supply. That's not going to help. The rise in the price of bus fares, well, people are obviously going to get more cars because of the, the price of, of the um, substitute has gone up. That's going to increase demand. And a fall in the cost of production means they're going to supply more. So uh, that's going to increase the price to C. And I'll just show you why D is wrong. The rise in the price of petrol, that's a complement to cars. If people are going to demand less of them. That's a shift in demand to the left, not the right. It's fall, so it can't be right. Question 11. A specific tax is placed upon each bottle of perfume sold. Here we have a diagram um, where SS is the supply curve before tax, and then you've got a tax applied um, of size T, T here to W. So that area there is the size of the tax, the a vertical distance between the supply curves, and which is the tax revenue paid by consumers. So we basically know here that if the air, total area of the tax is this, we know that consumers will always be the top part. Um, um, the instance of tax that falls on consumers is above the instance of tax that falls on producers. So if QRWU is going to be that area, then that's just an understanding how taxes work and on diagram. So just learn that as a fact. Just learn to identify those areas. We see them come up all the time and you shouldn't be making those mistakes now. You've done kind of four weeks of these papers. Goods X and good Y and good Y, good X and good Y are complements. What will be the effect of the equilibrium price of quantity of good X? Will it increase the supply of Y? So we're increasing the supply. That's going to lower the price right of Y, uh, given that demand doesn't change. So if we're lowering the price of good Y, what happens to the equilibrium price of X? Well, it's going to increase because it's a, it's a complement. So people are going to demand more of it. Um, what's going to happen to the equilibrium quantity? It's going to increase as well. So both of those are going to increase, and you can show that just because uh, when you get the increase in supply and the price goes down of the complement, people are going to demand more, more of Y, so they're also going to demand more of X. So demand goes up, price goes up, quantity goes down. Simple, simple complement, understanding of how complements affect each other. Question 13. Here the table shows the price Rashid is willing to pay for successive cakes and their production costs. So here we know his willingness to pay, to pay. And here's the production cost. We had a really similar question like this in the other multiple choice paper this week, except that the production cost was uh, constant in all those cases. Whereas here, oh, the price was constant here, so the production cost is changing. So if the price is 50 and Rashid buys four cakes, what is the monetary value of the consumer surplus and producer surplus? So here we know that it's a really similar question to last time. We're going to hold the price of 50. So in the first the first cake, well, let's do the consumer surplus first. He pays 50. His willingness to pay was 90. Consumer surplus at 40. What's the difference here? 30. So that's an overall of 70. And we've got 15 there. So 70, uh, 70 plus 15 is 85. So we know it's 85. And um, let's just check. So we'd obviously know that it's C, but let's just check the producer surplus. Selling them for 50 would have sold for 20. Producer surplus of 30. Uh, 30, 30 cents, sorry. 20 cent there would have sold, sold for 30, would have sold for 50. So 30 plus 20, 20 plus, uh, 20 plus 30, sorry, is 50. Plus the 10 there is 60, so 0 0.6 cent, 0 0.6 dollars or 60 cent, and we're 85, so it is C. We had a question like that in the other paper, so you should be good at those by now. Here, question 14, the diagram shows the market supply and demand curves for wheat. What should a government do to maintain a minimum price of OP? Two. So we've got o, uh, o to P2. They want to maintain the minimum price. What does it want to do? Well, to do that, it needs to create a shortage, right? It needs to buy the quantity K to R. And by do, by the government doing that, it's going to restrict output to that much. And we know that when, out, when output is K, the price that's demanded and the price that's supplied over there is, um, is P2. So by creating the minimum price there, they have to buy out that surplus quantity there. Consumers. So because uh, at that price, um, demand only matches supply here, there's all this spare capacity and they're going to have to buy that quantity. That's how minimum prices work. Question 15. The product with infinite elasticity of supply has sales of a thousand units a week at a price of one dollar per unit. So infinite elasticity of supply simply means that when the price gets higher, um, you just infinitely start producing more. So if the price elasticity 
of demand is 1.5 over the relative re- relevant range and the government imposes a tax of 10%, um, what will the government's weekly tax revenue be? So they sold a thousand units a week uh, at the price of one. We've now increased the price, right? So we've increased the price by 10%. So now instead of costing one, it's now costing uh, one, $1.10. Well, we know that the price of the SEC demand is 1.5. So if we increase the price by 10%, what's demand going to fall by? Well, demand is going to fall by 1.5%. Uh, so that's um, uh, by uh, 15%, sorry. So 10% increase, 15% decrease because it's 1.5. Um, what's what's 15% of um, 1,000? Well, it's 150. So 1,000 minus 150 is 850. So it's now selling 850 units. At one at one dollar because the tax the tax is an increase in the price but the the units don't get it so uh, what's the weekly tax revenue well they're getting ten percent of um, eight hundred and fifty um, units right so they're now eight hundred fifty units and they're getting ten percent of that so eight hundred and so eight hundred fifty units at a dollar per unit is eight hundred fifty dollars they're getting ten percent eighty five dollars there we go answers B. Question 16. A government pays a subsidy to a country's onion producers. Weird, but OK. <laughs> With which price elasticity of demand will this action be most effective in reducing the price of onions? So if you're paying a subsidy to the producers, it means you're giving them money to kind of reduce their production costs. How would this action be most effective in reducing the price? Well, if price elasticity of demand equals zero, then we know that it's not going to the price. The demand isn't going to change. And so the price of onions is evidently going to uh, reduce in that case when you start like giving uh, producers some some money they're just going to reduce the price and um, the price elasticity of demand there doesn't for the, you don't lose any demand so they're obviously going to get some money uh, if it's zero they don't the kind of there isn't a change in demand when you kind of reduce your price uh, and so that's that's um, that's what we're we're kind of looking for there so uh, question 17, which statement best describes a transfer payment? So this is just a definitional question. So a transfer payment is one where kind of money is moving between two people to the other, but they don't get anything in, 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 in exchange. So if I just transferred um, money into my other bank account, that's a transfer payment. If I just transferred money to my parents randomly, that's not, um, I, don't, I don't get anything in return, then that's a transfer payment. So what is it? Well, it's a payment to individuals who aren't, and it's not linked to any economic activity. There's no exchange there. There's nothing in return. There's no supply and demand. It's simply just giving someone else money. So that's what we describe a transfer payment. It's certainly not any of the others there. So you could either solve this problem by understanding really what a transfer payment is or by very clearly kind of eliminating the other two options there. Question 18. On 1st of May 2012, President Morales of Bolivia announced the nationalization of the, now you can hear my Spanish accent, no, the Spanish accent, um, Transportadora de Electricidad, TDE, which is a subsidiary of the Spanish company that owned and ran approximately three quarters of Bolivia's power grid. Um, so what can we kind of conclude from this? So the fact that, um, the, well, it's kind of what is a nationalization is going on. So the Bolivian employees of TDE will own 100% of the shares. That's not what a nationalization is. Only Bolivian nationals be able to work. We definitely don't know that. Uh, you could nationalize an industry and use foreign nationals to run it. TDE company shares will be sold to a Bolivian company. That's not what nationalization is either. Nationalization is basically a government takes over the ownership of a company. So then British railways used to be nationalized as a good example. And what happened there was the government basically owned and ran the railways in Britain. Um, so nationalization is the government taking over ownership of a company. Right. Question 19. An economy faces rising raw material costs and a fall in business confidence. How are the economy's real GDP and the price that will be affected? So let's think about rising raw material costs, what that's going to do. Well, that's going to increase your price level. But a fall in business confidence is could, could transfer it the other way. So we don't really know. What we know is so the price level may rise or fall, um, depending on how, which one's bigger, uh, whether the rise in raw materials, raw materials or the fall in business confidence is bigger. But what we do know is that the real GDP will definitely fall because rising raw material costs uh, are going to kind of increase um, the prices, increase prices, thereby reducing consumption. And rising raw material costs are also going to mean that you produce less in the economy. 
uh, you probably have to import more, etc. Import kind of your imports become more expensive because uh, you import most of your raw, mater- raw materials and uh, therefore imports going to be a greater leakage out of kind of the, the GDP equation. And a fall in business confidence means probably less investment, less consumption, um, et cetera. So you're also going to see GDP fall there. So it's just important to know that both of those are going to cause the real GDP to fall. But that also that it's not clear because they're kind of counteracting effects of rising raw material costs, causing inflation and falling business confidence, reducing inflation. So that that's going to kind of counteract each other. But we don't know which one's bigger. But therefore, we can't kind of conclude what will happen to the price level there. So it may rise or fall. Question 20, the diagram shows aggregate demand curve. What is measured on the horizontal X axis and what's measured on the vertical Y axis? This is just an understanding of AD. Well, I can just tell you that on the X axis shows real GDP or national income. It's kind of those. And on the vertical axis, we show the price level. So it's just worth knowing that on GDP. That's a really easy definitional question. Question 21. Here we have the table showing information about a country whose consumers spend their income on three commodities, P, Q and R. So we can see the index of price in year one, they're all at 100. In year two, they're showing at 160. Um, we've got some deflation there. So kind of we've got deflation of 20 percent, increased inflation of 60 percent and no inflation on R. So between one and two, how has the general price level changed altogether? So we can say that the general price level has changed. Um, how has the general price level changed? Well, what they're kind of asking us to do is to kind of weight these. So here, uh, the 60 is worth, is, is worth 100 million. Uh, that's worth 100 million as well. But the 80 the, to the fall in 20 is worth three times because it's 300 million. So we times that fall in 20 by three, fall in 60 percent, essentially. And that's going to counteract the price. So we know that it's the same. So it's not just about reading the index, but also reading the weighting because of this consumer. And that's how we can say the general price level has remained the same. Question 22, the UK inflation rate as measured by CPI was 5.2% in September 2011, which is quite high. In June 2014, the inflation rate was 1.6%. That's what we've had more recently. What can definitely be concluded about that period? So what, what do we know? Well, we don't really know that well, they fell. But what we do know about this was that during that period, UK inflation was continually positive, right? So it's always been above 0%. And at that point, because we have inflation, we we don't we remember inflation, falling inflation just means that the rate of price is still increasing. It's still positive inflation, but it's just more slow. So the, the rate of price increases was slowing as CPI fell from 5.6%. We can't really make any conclusions. Prices weren't falling. Remember, they were still going up. That's the one a lot of people would be tempted to say. We don't know. They definitely weren't falling because inflation was always positive, but they were just increasing more slowly. Question 23. If a country has a surplus in its balance of payments, then its money supply is likely to. Uh, and the answer here. So what's the surplus in balance of payments? Well, it's um, importing more than it's exporting. It's like the money supply is likely to increase because then you get more foreign currency in for exports and that then gets exchanged for domestic currency. So that's just about knowing that you're going to have more exports than imports in the case of balance of payments. And then understanding what that export import balance will a more heavy export balance will do to the domestic currency. And so the answer is, is very clear there. Question 24. In the diagram, the foreign exchange market is initially in equilibrium at X. It's there. What could be the new equilibrium? So we've got an increase in demand for U.S. residents for holidays in Europe. So this is euros. So what's going to happen? Well, we know that demand for the currency is going to go up. Right. And um, we know, therefore, the, or sorry, supply. So demand for the currency, uh, sorry, supply, uh, demand for the currency isn't going to change. Um, what we do know is that there's going to be an increase in supply of um, of dollars because more people are going to want to exchange their dollars for euros. And uh, no one really wants euros so much. It's not that that's increased. It's simply that uh, supply of euros has uh, of, of do- no one's going to increase their demand for dollars. Sorry, no one really wants dollars. The supply of dollars has definitely increased as more people come to Europe on holiday and then need to change their dollars for euros. They're going to, well, supply more dollars out there in order to get that switch. So what do we know is going to happen? Well, we've got to just see a supply shift out. We're going to get to D. And that's going to be a fall in the price of Euro, US dollars and euros there. So D is just D because of the supply shift. There is no demand shift there. Question 25. 
what combination of changes in import prices and export prices would result in a fall in of the value in the value of a country's terms of trade. So we want something where we know that terms of trade is a relative price change. We want one where export prices are going down relative to import prices. Let's have a look. Well, a decrease here they're both decreasing, but obviously export prices are decreasing more. So we know there that we're going to get a fall in the value of terms of trade because import prices, imports are becoming more valuable relative to that. The export there. Uh, the others wouldn't result in that kind of relationship. So you could go through them and check, but um, understanding terms of trade and uh, kind of assessing the um, the kind of position, the increases increases here to find one where you get an increase in the relative price, um, average price of imports compared to the relative price of exports is is what's going to give you the answer. So on the final stretch now, question 26, the diagram shows the production of Curves for two countries X and Y. Uh, here we have a decrease in productivity, which is going to move countries X P P C from X1, which is there, to X2 compared to country Y. So what's going to happen? So what's going to happen? Well, what we know is that before that it would have had probably uh, produced, exported its manufacturing goods um, for and imported some other goods or just produced itself. But now, clearly, it's because it's insecting, it can do better off than trading, right? So here, it, it's official for it to kind of produce all of its manufacturing goods, uh, uh, sorry, produce all its raw material goods there because it has comparative advantage in it and import some of um, country-wise manufacturing goods. So the switch here where you've got the kind of uh, PPCs means you're going to get trade and then just understanding where the opportunity costs. Y has comparative advantage in manufacturing goods, whereas X has comparative advantage in uh, raw materials, means that you're going to get that kind of relationship there, exporting the raw materials to country Y and importing some of country Y's manufacturing goods. Question 27. What's the main argument a government of a small country might use in times of a worsening worldwide recession to justify increase in import tariffs and other trade protectionist policies? Well, what might it do if it wants to kind of uh, increase its import tariffs? Well, it might want the country to um, stop having to import as much and raise taxes to make imports more expensive. And that way, what it's going to do is it's going to keep more people employed, because if you can't import as much, domestic production becomes way more important. Um, so that's going to protect the country from a rise in domestic unemployment. Uh, that's generally the case in a worldwide recession. Unemployment is one of the things you really want to think about. So if you're importing loads of goods, for example, that's really not helpful because your domestic, you're kind of substituting domestic production for international production, and that's going to put your domestic businesses out of out of business, and they're going to make people unemployed. So if you want to protect that from happening, you really want to make your domestic industries important to do that is by increasing tariffs and reducing dependence on imports. Question 28, what would be classified as a supply side policy measure? So we want to think about something that's going to boost the um, supply side, the productive capacity of an economy. So let's just go through the others and then I'll return to A. So a reduction in the government's fiscal deficit, that's evidently demand side. It's changing taxes, changing spending. Open market sale of securities. Securities are just types a type of equity. Uh, that's on the demand side as well. An imposition of a tariff on imported goods. Again, we know that imports are from A and B. So by elimination, we could say that it's A, but why is it A? Well, trade unions decide wages. And if we change the power of trade, trade unions, maybe we're going to reduce wages. Uh, by saying that trade unions have less negotiating power, um, less control over wages. So they're going to kind of allow firms to uh, employ more people for lower for lower wages. And that's going to obviously increase productive capacity. So it could be classed as a supply side policy. Right. Twenty nine. Which policy measure is an expenditure switching measure designed to reduce the current account surplus? So we're thinking expenditure switching. So if we've got a current account surplus, what we can do, we're going to try and stop people um we don't really want people to stop um, importing as much. Um, how do we do that? Well, we can get them to switch from export, from importing to kind of consuming domestic, domestically produced goods, or we can just cut their amount of spending overall so imports goes down. That would be expensive reducing, but we're interested in the first one where we're stopping people, we're making people switch from spending their money on import to domestically produced things. And how might we do that? Well, if we want, sorry, we're reducing current account surplus. That'd be if we're reducing current account deficit. So here we've got a current account surplus. They've got people ex we're exporting way too much. So you want to stop exports. How do we do that? Well, we might try and make our goods more expensive. Why might our goods have been cheap before? Well, if we had subsidies, 
that's going to make our goods cheap. And if we want the pe- uh, people to stop kind of buying our goods, importing our export, and then export someone else, we want to make our goods relatively more expensive. So if we take away our subsidies, clearly our goods are going to get, our exports are going to get more expensive, and that's an expenditure switching policy. Question 30, sorry, I got it the wrong way around, I didn't read the question. Uh, question 30, a com- last one, a country faces twin problems of deflation and a current account deficit on the balance of payments. It decides to run a budget deficit and to lower interest rate. rates. Which effects are these likely to have on its twin problems? So a country has these twin problems, deflation, the current account. It's running a budget deficit. So it's spending more money than it's, it's kind of spending more money uh, than it has. And it's lowering interest rates. What's it doing? Well, deflation is clearly going to improve. Uh, we want to, cr- we're creating inflationary pressure there by lowering the interest rates and running a budget deficit. We're going to run up the inflation because remember it's being cheeky. It's not asking for inflation, it's asking for deflation. So we're going to try and inflate the economy. So deflation is going to improve. And what's going to happen to the current account deficit? Well, lowering interest rates and running a budget deficit are going to uh, principally kind of this lowering interest rates is going to worsen the current account deficit. Obviously, that's going to make us make people put less money in our country. Um, they're going to invest less in the UK. Uh, we're going to have less money flowing in through it as well. So summing up, that was a, a kind of more straightforward question. We're pending a paper. We're now tending to see the same types of questions crop up again and again. Uh, that's all the papers for this week. Uh, again, once again, lastly, I apologise for all the kind of problems we had this week. And these papers have come quite late. I hope you found them helpful. And I'm sure you will be a lot more kind of on time and prompt getting the papers to you next week. Uh, remember to send me any questions. Thanks and have a good weekend.